Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for plastic surgery in the setting of skin cancer, facilitated by Dr. Farber with Killingsworth Center for Plastic Surgery and moderated by Dr. Kunalakis with the Northside Hospital Cancer Institute Melanoma Program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of the virtual programs offered. If this is your first time participating in a Cancer Support Community Atlanta program, we invite you to complete a new attendee form to stay connected to all future events. Again, welcome everyone to today's program, Plastic Surgery in the Setting of Skin Cancer, with Dr. Farber and Dr. Kunalakis. I'm Katie Armsby, the Program Outreach Director with Cancer Support Community Atlanta. If this is your first time participating in a Cancer Support Community Atlanta program, we invite you to visit our website, cscatlanta.org, where you can see a complete list of the virtual oncology support programs offered. These include virtual support groups led by licensed mental health professionals, a monthly nutrition seminar with Kristen Kukulowski from Northside Hospital Cancer Institute, stress reduction classes like yoga and Tai Chi, and of course, education programs like this one today. And if you ever miss a live event, you're welcome to find a recording of it under the video tab of our video library, again, at our website. That's cscatlanta.org. And I want to highlight our monthly melanoma support group that meets virtually. So for more information on that program, again, please visit our website, and that's cscatlanta.org. So everyone will remain on mute for the duration of today's program. We invite you to enter questions into the program chat box, which Dr. Farber and Dr. Kunalakis will address at the end of the program during the Q&A time permitting. I'm excited to welcome today's program moderator back to a virtual platform with us, Dr. Kunalakis. Dr. Nicole Kunalakis is a board certified and fellowship trained surgical oncologist. She earned her medical degree and completed her surgical residency at the Rutgers Medical Hospital in New Jersey. She completed her surgical oncology fellowship at City of Hope Medical Center in Duarte, California. Dr. Kunalakis was an associate professor at University of Colorado and joined Northside Melanoma and Sarcoma Specialist to serve as their medical director. She's an expert in the treatment of melanoma and sarcoma and is committed to providing patients with the best possible cancer care in alignment with their individual goals and needs. So again, welcome Dr. Kunalakis and I'll pass it off to you to introduce today's presenter. Um, hi, yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Stephanie Farber is somebody I've been working with um, consistently since she's arrived here in Atlanta. We're so lucky to have her. She specializes in both cosmetic and reconstructive surgery, and I have worked with her in caring for our melanoma patients. So we're both very excited to give this talk. Um, she completed her plastic surgery residency at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, which is a very competitive program um, and one of the best in the country to, in which to be trained in plastic surgery. And she uh, was recruited here to work for um, Killingsworth Center for Plastic Surgery. Um, and yeah, she's committed to making all her patients look and feel their best. So really excited to be doing this talk and to work with Dr. Farber as we care for our cancer patients. Thank you, Dr. Kunalakis, and it's always a pleasure to work with you as well. So thank you all for attending this presentation on plastic surgery in the setting of skin cancer. Um, I think it's great we're doing this because a lot of the time, Dr. Kunalakis and I see our new patients and they're overwhelmed by the amount of information. So this is a little bit of pre a preview so that you can understand all of that before if you ever have to see either one of us for that reason. So here's a general outline of my presentation. Today, we'll go through the chronology of events. So we'll start with what to expect before surgery. We'll move on to the day of surgery and after surgery. And I'll also discuss when you see me as your plastic surgeon and what we talk about at that consultation. So beginning with before surgery, what are the different types of skin cancer? Well, there are multiple. This slide goes through the three main types of skin cancer, which are squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Each of them are managed differently. And Dr. Kunalakis, if you don't mind, I'll have you go into a little bit more detail on this slide, talking about the types of cancer. Yes, I would say um, basal cell cancer is by far the most common. 
uh, and has the, the best outcomes. Squamous cell cancer is, uh, tends to um, be more peripherally spreading, meaning not doesn't form as much metastatic disease except for in immunocompromised patients such as transplant patients. Um, but both of these cancers can produce really big defects, which is where we need Dr. Farber's help um, sometimes in reconstructing the area. Melanoma is what our program specializes in. This is this tends to do, um, this is the rarest of the three, but uh, tends to spread um, to the lymph nodes and distantly in about 20% of all patients who have this diagnosis. Um, so yeah, that is the, the cancer now that people are using something called immunotherapy for, and the outcomes have improved significantly in the past five years. Thank you, Dr. Kunalakis. So next, how is skin cancer diagnosed? And generally, it's neither me nor Dr. Kunalakis who makes the original diagnosis. It's either a primary care doctor or a dermatologist or a patient who sees something abnormal, sees a physician who performs a biopsy. So these are the three main types of biopsies that you may undergo to make a diagnosis of any of these types of skin cancer. On the top left, you see a shave biopsy, which is just what it sounds like, where the any mole or abnormal area of tissue is just shaved off. The next is a punch biopsy, also just what it sounds like, where a special tool is used to punch out part or sometimes all of the area. And then finally on the bottom right is an excisional biopsy where the entire lesion is removed. So Dr. Kunalakis, I don't know, maybe you have something to add for this slide as well. I would say the most common biopsy that you'll get at your dermatologist's office is usually gonna be a shave biopsy. Um, that's just usually their practice and offers the diagnosis in, in the easiest uh, way. And of course, all of these are done with local anesthesia so that they're not painful. And um, you'll go home that same day with either a dressing or stitches in place. So how do I prepare for my surgery? Well, you'll see Dr. Kunalakis and I who will give you all of your instructions for pre and post-operative. Oftentimes we'll have our patients see their primary care doctor just to get cleared for surgery, make sure they're as healthy as can be before undergoing anesthesia. And in addition to seeing your primary care doctor, some other things that you can do on your own from my perspective that help a lot with wound healing and your recovery are most importantly by far, if you smoke, if you, if you vape, if you use any type of nicotine products, stop that constricts blood vessels, inhibits oxygen delivery to nearby tissues. So it really interferes with wound healing. And my patients who stop smoking do have much better outcomes. Another one is if you have diabetes to get your blood sugar under control as reflected by your A1C. So that's done, something that's done both by you and by your primary care doctor or endocrinologist. And also protein intake is really important for wound healing. So if you have a diet that's low in protein, it's important to increase that so that your wounds heal better. And at your preoperative appointment, we'll talk about exactly how you know how much protein you should be taking in in order to make sure your wounds heal as well as possible. So then seeing a plastic surgeon. Normally, Dr. Kunalakis sends patients to me who have either a very large defect that can't be closed just with stitches, a defect in a cosmetically sensitive area, like somewhere on the face or neck, something that's very visible, or an area that's functionally sensitive. So this can include something on the hands, the feet, the eyelids, any area that you use for function and that we need to make sure heals very well. So next on the day of surgery, what to expect. So we do our surgeries in the hospital. So you'll come to the hospital, you'll go to the preoperative area, they'll have you change into a gown, place an IV. You'll see the anesthesiologist who will talk to you about the details of anesthesia and exactly what to expect. And you'll see both Dr. Kunalakis and I to answer any last minute questions that you may have before the procedure. So in terms of the types of skin cancer surgery, the first thing that happens is that Dr. Kunalakis removes the affected area. 
So I'll have her talk about this slide and what exactly is involved in her portion of the operation. Uh, so there's two components. This is really specific to melanoma. Um, where we remove uh, about at least a centimeter to two centimeters of skin in order to achieve negative margins. You, know, you can see that, um, that uh, picture on the right showing the transected positive margin. That's always what we want to avoid. Um, we send the pathology to, we send the specimen to pathology so they can confirm uh, that the margins are negative, but unfortunately in melanoma, we don't usually receive that information in real time. Uh, the sentinel lymph node biopsy is uh, a procedure meant to remove lymph nodes that drain the tumor, and the indications for this procedure are when you have risk of having lymph node disease that's any that could approximately um, greater than 5%. So you can see that we do this sentinel lymph node procedure when we remove the melanoma at the same time, and approximately, again, about, you know, 20% of patients with melanoma. So I, I think one of the great things about Dr. Kunalakis and I working so well together is that we can discuss ahead of time if she has any particular concern based on her expertise of there being a positive margin. If she's worried that there's a positive margin or that there could be a positive margin, that does change our surgical plan. So I think in any case, it's really important that your um, cancer surgeon and your reconstructive surgeon work together closely. So then during the same operation, once Dr. Kunalakis finishes her part of the case, normally that's when I'll come in, I'll take a look at the wound and take my measurements and decide what to do. And this is sort of a view inside of my mind, the reconstructive pyramid. And this is how I decide what type of reconstruction I'll perform. Normally I have a plan ahead of time, that plan's always flexible, but just going through the pyramid, secondary intention is the simplest type of wound healing. It's letting a wound just heal by itself. The good thing is that it's easy from a surgical perspective, but the bad thing is that it takes a really long time and it doesn't always heal in a way that's predictable or cosmetically appealing. So this isn't something that we ordinarily do. The next level in the reconstructive pyramid is direct closure. This is normally what Dr. Kunalakis would do when I'm not involved. Anything above that level of the reconstructive pyramid is where a plastic surgeon is needed. So this is an example of direct closure. Like I said, that's what normally is performed if a plastic surgeon isn't involved. It's just simply closing the wound with stitches. The next tier, split thickness skin graft, is what I think of as the simplest option that I can offer. And I'm gonna show photos in the next few slides. Some of them are intraoperative photos. And I really wanna thank all of the patients who gave me permission to share their photos. Some of them include their faces. So I think it's really lovely of them that they're willing to have their photos shared publicly for educational purposes. So um, split thickness skin graft, like I said, simplest option for in terms of reconstruction. However, it's not always the most cosmetic. So normally I do this if an area is very large and there's not another good reconstructive option. If the patient has other medical problems that prevent me from doing something more complicated, or if a patient just wants something simple that they can recover from quickly with minimal risk of complications. So this is a patient who Dr. Kunalakis and I took care of together. He unfortunately was a smoker when he was diagnosed. And because the surgery happens pretty quickly after diagnosis, oftentimes there's not enough time for somebody to stop. So that's the original defect that you see on the top left. In the middle is the intraoperative defect. So once Dr. Kunalakis finished, this is what I came into the operating room to see. As you can see, it's about a 12 centimeter defect, which in inches is about four and a half. And the first thing that I do in cases like this where the wound is large is I place a special suture around the edges to act like a drawstring and bring it all together. So you can see if you look on the right, these are his, this is his photo from three months later. So he's pretty well healed at that at point in time, but the wound is much smaller than the intraoperative wound. And um, 
one of the downsides of a skin graft is that it's not the same color as the surrounding skin, not the same texture as the surrounding skin, and it doesn't have the same thickness because it's only the very top layer of skin, whereas all the layers of skin were removed during the surgery. So this is how the patient healed. He's very happy. He hasn't had any problems with it. So this turned out to be the right option for him. This next patient, another one that Dr. Kunalakis and I took care of together, he had a melanoma of his scalp. He worked full time. He wanted something that would get him back to work quickly. So in the scalp, there are lots of options that allow us to preserve hair bearing tissue. In his case, he was bald. So any type of flap would have really distorted his hairline and made it look abnormal. So what he and I decided together to do was to perform a skin graft, just like the last patient. And you can see it's a little bit of a different color. It's a little bit indented, but he was really happy with it because it let him get back to work quickly. He didn't have any problems with it healing and it accomplished all of his goals that we talked about preoperatively. So the next level in the reconstructive pyramid is a full thickness skin graft. Whereas a split thickness skin graft only takes the epidermis, the very top layer of skin, a full thickness skin graft takes all of the layers. So it is, can only be used in smaller defects since I'm taking a piece of skin from somewhere else. And it does tend to have a little bit better cosmetic appearance. So I, this photo that I'm showing here, the patient was only a week out from her surgery. So I'm sorry you can't get to see her fully healed, but she had a melanoma of her toe and the middle defect is after it's removed. And then on the right side, you see after the skin graft is in place, right when I take the dressing down. And Dr. Kunalakis, I'll let you explain. I'm sure our audience is wondering why the toe is blue in the middle picture. Yeah, um, so we inject this blue dye around the melanoma uh, to allow us to localize the lymph nodes draining that portion of skin. So yeah, that blue dye is something that we, the surgical oncologists, inject. It usually, um, it gets excreted through your urine and it's usually out of your body completely and out of the skin within uh, a week. So you can see her a week later, most of it's gone. And I've seen her since, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't take any photos when I saw her after that, but uh, she wasn't blue anymore. And the full thickness skin graft heals to look like a similar quality as the surrounding skin. And because her defect was so small, I was able to use that in her. Now the next tier on the reconstructive pyramid, again, getting a little bit more complicated, is a regional flap. So this is when I move nearby tissue that's similar color, similar thickness, similar quality into the area to close the defect. So this was a young patient who had a melanoma of his leg. You can see it's a little bit scabby there because it had already been biopsied. Um, again, this is the defect after it was excised and now we all know why it's blue. And you can see my markings there for how I mobilized skin and moved it over into the adjacent area. So on the far right, you see him two months out. He has two little scabby areas that will all heal. But otherwise you can see that unlike a skin graft, the area that's been reconstructed is just as thick as the surrounding skin. It's growing leg hair like his surrounding skin. It's the same color. So once he's fully healed, this will be very imperceptible to where a lot of people wouldn't even know he had anything done. So I offered this for this patient because he was very young, very healthy, and very motivated to have a reconstruction where it was cosmetic. And in 20 years from now, he won't be looking at his leg and be reminded that he had melanoma. This lovely lady had a skin cancer on the side of her nose. So on, I also used a regional flap for her. What I did was I took the wrinkle nasolabial fold by the side of the mouth. So she was joking with me that she got a facelift on one side. And you can see her one week later, she's still bruised. She's, the flap is still swollen. I had just taken the stitches out there, but once everything flattens out and the bruising goes away, she'll have skin that's very similar in thickness and quality to the side of her nose to where once the scar heals, it won't be very perceptible to those around her. And then here's another lovely lady who had a skin cancer on her nasal ala, which is another name for the nostril. 
So I took, again, tissue from the junction between her nose and her cheek and put it in that defect. This was as soon as I finished the surgery. So she still has stitches in place, but when that heals, she'll have skin of a very similar texture, quality, and color to the skin that is missing from the defect. So what happens after surgery? In terms of the recovery, our patients almost always go home the same day. Dr. Kunalakis and I both inject numbing medicine, so the pain is very manageable and normally doesn't start until about a day after the surgery. At that point, a lot of the initial post-operative pain has subsided to where it's very tolerable. And when you see me in the office, I give all of my patients their prescriptions for after the surgery. And I like to use a lot of non-narcotic medications so that we can avoid the narcotic side effects. So you'll have lots of tools in your toolbox to try to treat the pain without using narcotics, which we think is great. And like I said, you do normally go home the same day. In terms of activity, I tell almost all of my patients, depending on their surgery, no heavy lifting and no strenuous activity for about a month. Depending on what part of your body is involved, I may ask you to elevate it, you may need to have stitches removed. Very occasionally when I perform one of those local flaps, I'll place a drain that will have to be removed a week or two after. But my patients recover very well. And Dr. Kunalakis and I like to coordinate their follow-up appointment one week later so that they can see both of us the same day, get their pathology results from the surgery, and also have their first follow-up with me to see how things are healing. So we are both happy to take any of your questions at this time. This is my um, work email, my office contact information, and my website if you would like to speak to me after the presentation. And right now, we'll just open it up for questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Farber. That was a really helpful talk. I just want to also reiterate how important it is when you have your cancer diagnosis to work with a multidisciplinary team um, and a place uh, that has experts uh, both in pathology, surgery, plastics, um, radiology. Uh, just there have been multiple studies that show that that provides better outcomes, um, cancer outcomes. Um, and here at Northside, I feel very fortunate to be a part of that. Um, so I was, I was going to address some, some um, questions. Uh, what, are, what are the complications to be expected um, after plastic surgery? And, and who usually manages them? Dr. Kunalakis, I can feel that one. Um, I Almost all of the complications are managed by me. I tell my patients that hopefully you don't have to see Dr. Kunalakis again because your cancer's gone, but you'll be seeing me for the rest of your life because I like to see my patients at least annually to check how things are healing. So right after surgery, the main complications we see are either separation of the wound, um, infection is very rare, bleeding is very rare. Normally, if there is any separation of the wound, it's something that heals by itself. So if you remember the patient I showed who had the reconstruction of his leg, he had those two scabby areas. Those were areas of tiny separation. We didn't have to do anything surgically. He didn't even have to do any dressings. I just put some gauze on it and told him to see me in a week. So um, that's the most common complication. From a cancer perspective, I would say a potential complication is that the margins aren't negative and another excision is required. Normally, we plan for that kind of thing ahead of time, so we're not surprised by something like that. Dr. Kunalakis, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to my answer there. Yeah, so um, if we are, if we're very concerned about margins, um, we would do something called staging the surgery where I remove the, the tumor to begin with. And, and that picture that Dr. Farber showed of the woman with the, the melanoma on her nose, um, that was somebody that we were trying to minimize how much skin we were removing because it's such a cosmetically sensitive area. But in the end, she did have a positive margin and needed to go back. So for her, we, we didn't, um, 
we didn't do the reconstruction until we were certain all the cancer has been removed. So sometimes, unfortunately, the patients do need to go back to the OR for the reconstruction, but usually uh, we can do everything at the same time. Uh, and, um, and, and that's the real kind of oncologic issue is making sure all the cancer has been removed. When we remove lymph nodes too, sometimes there can be um, fluid collections that form under the groin. Um, those are things that I would take care of as a surgical oncologist. And sometimes there can be uh, problems with lymphedema but is also something that as a surgical oncologist, I, I manage. But th those are, um, since we will be seeing the patient back frequently, we will obviously address those concerns um, together. And Dr. Kunalakis, one of the things I really appreciate about working with you is that anytime I see one of your patients, I always give you a call and we talk about how we're gonna manage it. If you are concerned about margins, that woman that the, woman with the nasal wound who we worked on together. Um, we had a conversation the night before her surgery and decided that it probably wasn't a good idea to do the reconstruction then because Dr. Kunalakis was concerned about margins and she was right. So um, I think us working together really helped her to get the most appropriate care. Yeah, well, good. Um, so, so that was a really good question. Uh, there was another question that I thought was good. Um, uh, who, I get this a lot. Who did, who, what determines if a melanoma should be removed by a dermatologist or a surgeon? So dermatologists take care of the ma majority of the melanoma seen in the community. Once it gets past a certain depth, um, and that's just how we score and stage melanoma, that's when I get involved as a surgical oncologist. And that specific depth is 0 0.8 millimeters. So again, we generally, a surgical oncologist, see about 30%, 20 to 30% of the melanomas out there. But yes, the majority of the melanomas are treated probably in the community by your local dermatologist. And here in Atlanta, there are so many good options for that. Um, and um, another question here, this is for Dr. Farber. Um, what can be done post-surgery to minimize the appearance of a scar? So that's a good question. Um, initially, after the surgery, I'll tell you exactly what dressings to apply. So for about a month after surgery, you'll be doing either those dressings or just keeping it covered. Once things are healed, the most important thing that I tell my patients to do to prevent scarring is sunscreen. And we'll go over exactly what ingredients your sunscreen should have so that it's most effective. But in patients who have lighter pigmentations and get exposed to the sun, they're at risk of having very pink scars. In patients with darker pigmentation, they're at risk of having more hyperpigmented scars. So sun protection really helps with all of that. Even when wearing clothing over it, the sun's rays can still penetrate your clothing. So my first patient I showed with the skin graft on his upper arm, he actually purchased SPF clothing so that he has double protection. And that's why his skin graft blends so nicely with his surrounding skin because he's really been protecting it from the sun. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Not only can the sun's harmful UV rays cause cancer, it can also really um, affect how your scar heals uh, um, after these surgeries. Mm -hmm. um, other questions, or is this generally an outpatient procedure? I think Dr. Farber uh, um, addressed that, that these are almost always outpatient surgeries. Um, and another question is how long after surgery until I can resume normal activity and exercise? I tell patients that they should almost always be walking even the day of surgery. Walking's great for your physical health, preventing blood clots. I think it's really important. In terms of strenuous activity or anything that raises heart rate or blood pressure, I have my patients wait about a month, depending on exactly what operation they've had. And same for heavy lifting. People always ask me about when they can drive again. And I really leave that up to my patients to determine when they feel they can react quickly and effectively in an unexpected scenario while driving. 
Yeah. I know everybody wants to drive again very quickly. I always say if you're still taking narcotics, you can't drive. Yeah. <laughs> and usually try to get them to wait at least several days. Um, there, was, there was a question about um, which procedures require a drain and how long do they stay in? So, so my drains are different than Dr. Farber's drains. I usually only have to leave a drain if I'm removing a, a large amount of lymph nodes, um, which is different than the sentinel lymph node biopsy. We don't do that procedure, thankfully, that much anymore, but that is why I have to leave a drain in. And my drains usually stay in about two weeks. Um, so that, that's when I use a drain. How about you, Dr. Farber? I use a drain if I'm doing a local flap that is larger because I'm elevating a big piece of tissue and I don't want any fluid to collect beneath it. So that would be the time that I would use a drain. Um, I didn't use a drain in any of the local flaps that I showed in the presentation today. So I don't use it very commonly for things like this. When I do use it, um, it's about one to two weeks that it stays in. I send my patients home with a drain log. So I remove it based on the amount of fluid that's being produced each day. Once it gets below a certain cutoff, then I know it's safe to remove. Yeah. Well, well, good. I think those are um, most of the, I think we addressed all the questions. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, we definitely still have time to address them. Okay, um, Katie, was there anything you wanted to say? Um, I think we had one other question come in. I will throw it out to you guys and you can let me know who you think might be best to address this. This might be going back again to using um, sunscreen for that scarring. A participant said, last month I had a double mastectomy. Um, is there a good way to kind of treat the area that was used, um, or that might be scarring, I'm sorry. I know you had mentioned kind of sunscreen. What about lotion, scar tape, massage? Do you recommend any of those things? So I think for her, it probably depends on her particular situation. I'm not sure if she had any type of reconstruction because that would also affect what can be applied to those wounds. But, um, She's still in the very early wound healing period. I tell my patients that they won't know the final appearance of their scar for about a year. And at that point in time, if it's still not acceptable to them, there are laser treatments, there are injections, there are all kinds of things that we can do to improve a scar. But I think in her early post-operative period, I would need a little bit more information in order to be able to make a good recommendation. Okay, we invite everyone else. If you have any questions, feel free to enter those into the chat box. Um, I also want to again remind everyone that we have the monthly melanoma support group through Cancer Support Community Atlanta. For additional information on that program, you can visit us at our, we our website, cscatlanta.org. Um, and I also want to, Dr. Farber, do you want to share how people again can connect with you or any kind of final thoughts as we wrap everything up? Sure. So if, if you have any, I tell all my patients, if you ever just want to talk and get more information, every surgery is a big decision, a big commitment. So you can always make an appointment to come talk to me. My office phone number is 678-208-6008. Um, website is killingsworthplasticsurgery.com. So you can visit us there as well. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Farber. We did have another question come in that I'll throw out to you guys. Participant shares that she has a scar from a birthmark that was removed. Is it possible um, to redo the scar to make it look better after a few years? Yes, it's absolutely possible. I often see patients who have had something removed and they're not happy with how it healed. Um, and it's not because anything was done wrong. I think if, if some kind of mole is being removed because there's a concern that it could be cancer, obviously the priority is the removal and not the closure. So if time has passed and a patient's not happy with how it looks, 
yes, it can always be revised. Our goal is to make the scar a fine line to where it's nearly imperceptible. Okay, great, thank you. And Dr. Kunalakis, I will throw it out to you too. Do you have any kind of final thoughts you'd like to share or how people can connect with you? Um, yeah, well, I work here at Northside. Our program's the Melanoma Sarcoma Specialists of Georgia. You can find us on the Northside um, webpage and we specialize in the treatment of melanoma and sarcoma and other skin cancers. And um, yeah, just when you're looking for where to get your cancer treatment, I do recommend going to a place that offers a multidisciplinary team um, so you can provide the best oncologic outcomes. And yes, well, thank you so much for um, listening to our talk. And uh, um, please always feel free to reach out with any questions. Yeah, and thank you both Dr. Farber and Dr. Kunalakis for such great information. Um, this recording of today's program will go under the video library at our website. So if you'd like to share a link to that with anyone, it should be there maybe, um, I'm thinking next week it'll be posted. So feel free to look for that there. Thank you both again and everyone take care. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.